What's up, everybody? So I'm going to talk about activation. I assume all of you know what activation is roughly. So like Dave McClure's uh, startup metrics for pirates thing is like acquisition, activation, and you see retention, revenue, or so. And that's just like the basics of your marketing process. So basically, activation is super important. Like a lot of people talk about growth hacking and whatnot. And if you think about it, like activation plays a huge role in how you can acquire users. Like if you have, if you're only activating 50% of the people that sign up for your site, app, whatever, you're actually paying double. Like all of your ad spend is essentially double because you're not getting anyone coming through the door and like using your product, paying you money. All that stuff. So it's really, really important. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to go over onboarding, activation, and key things that you guys can do to meaningfully improve your activation metrics like this week. So how many of you guys have issues or like things you want to improve with your onboarding or activation? Okay, cool. I like it. Can one or two of you tell me like what your problem is or what you're working on? Like what you want to improve with activation? Um users should understand what they can do with the side of that. Okay. So you're getting users who sign up and they're just confused. They're like they don't know what to do. Yeah, our our audience is not very tech savvy. Great. Cool. Anyone else? One more? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're working in a field that's somewhat new. Uh, I guess you'd say it's sort of like a, a buzzword that people know they should be using or doing when they get to your site. Um, what is it? Oh. Um, App store optimization. Okay, got it. Cool. Um, sort of like SEO for mobile. Yeah. Um, but uh, so they get to your site, they know they should be doing it, but they don't know what ASO is, or they don't know best practices, and sort of educating them right away, uh, like within the platform. Got it. Okay, so you're having trouble with people that sign up and then don't end up using you because they don't know what it is. They sign up because like they know they should be using it, uh -huh. but they don't know what it is. Really. Okay, cool. So you guys, if you know, if anyone has questions as I go through this, like let me know if I'm going too fast or if you want me to dig in on something. Happy to. So basically, I am Justin Mayers. Uh, I here, so I'm going to close out of these tabs we go through. I recently co-authored a book, it's a book called Traction Book, came out like two weeks ago. It's basically a lean start for how startups approach the process of getting traction. We talked about like how to structure the growth process and then do a quick dive into each of the 19 ways startups can acquire customers. So I'm also on Twitter at JW Mayers. I'm a terrible, terrible tweeter and like do nothing but self-promotion. So. Don't follow it. Uh, and then, formerly, I was director of revenue at Exceptional. So, Exceptional, we had a bunch of developer tools products. Uh, we were acquired by Rackspace like a year and a half ago uh, for eight figures. So, it was a really good acquisition. And so, an interesting thing about, and this is one of our products, our race. Interesting thing about the Exceptional experience was we actually didn't start the company, but we bought it off of a developer who was doing it in the side. And so what that meant is that this guy who was running it was charging two dollars a month for his account. It was just like a side thing that he did, you know, after he got his real job. And so he never did anything around retention, paid acquisition, activation, or whatever. And so when I came on, activation had never gotten any retention. Like we were getting uh, activation rates of roughly thirty percent, which is like really, really, really poor, if you can imagine. So that means like only three out of every ten people that signed up would actually like install the tool, send an error, they're paying us, whatever. So we had a lot of work to do there. So I'm going to talk about how I kind of changed that and like what we did just to improve this activation process overall. Does that sound good? Cool. So the first thing that we did is so the first thing, tracking. Tracking is super, super important. So do you guys are you guys like mixed panel, Fismetrics? What are we working with? Mixed panel. Mixed panel? Cool. Yeah, there we go. And so do you guys, like how granular in terms of onboarding do you all get when you do track? Like do you track every step in your onboarding flow? 
or what do you guys, do you just do like trial paid? Like how granular, granular do you all get? Yeah. Cool. Where do you work? Ancestor. Oh, cool. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah. Anyone else? Do you guys? I'm extreme opposite. We track like they get to page one, two, three, or four, and then after that they're on the email list. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so you work at a smaller startup. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, so I'm going to quickly give an example of what. So if you guys can see that, basically it is the breakdown of uh, something called Bingo Card Creator. It's like a tool by Pat Patrick McKenzie. Um, but basically you can see he broke his onboarding funnel into five discrete steps. So someone signed up for the product, hit the dashboard, create a list, customize the list, schedule a print, and download. So overall, what you want to do is track every step that is important for a new sign up or a new customer to take. And so for, for us uh, at Airbrake, we're a developer tool. We helped people find and fix and capture their uh, errors in their application. And so basically, we figured out that our key metrics were how many errors someone was tracking, how many errors they captured, and if they generated a test error within the first day. And so what we did is like we did a bunch of data analysis. like. Okay, so here are our ideal customers. What did they do on the first day, the first week that they signed up for a product? And so after doing that, we saw the best customers that we had sent an error on the first day, and then they ended up, they generated a test error on the first day, and then they would send us actual errors in production within the first step. And so we said, okay, so these are the key, those were like our key engagement metrics. So I want you guys to like think about what key actions an ideal customer would take after they join your application. So for us, we figured out we want people to generate a test error. We want them to start capturing errors in production within the first seven days. And if we can do that, we're going to massively increase the number of people that stay with us and the number of people that end up hanging. So if, if you guys have heard, have you guys heard like the Twitter tape study to like get someone to follow five people and suddenly like they're magically engaged? So that is the thing. That was like Twitter's key metric. Ours was getting people to track and capture their errors. How many of you know what that metric is right now? What is it? We have a set for yoga teachers in the eighth grade and we post an event or track from their best and most helpful. Cool. How did you figure, how did you come to that metric? Uh, it's sort of going the opposite way because once they do that, they have opportunities to change. And, Got it. And they're sort of relying on us to market themselves. Okay, cool. So, what we did, so basically, I want you guys, when you're trying to think of the key actions you want a customer and your son to take, like try and put yourself in the customer's shoes. Like a lot of people, I'm sure I do this too, if you sign up for a service or a tool, and you probably spend less than five minutes like looking at a landing page, type in your email address, make up some shit password, and then you're in. Like you don't actually spend time reading the about page, the team page, like the crunch base, everything that has to go with, you know, everything that has to do with these companies. And so as marketers and as product people, it's really easy to think, because you know your product so well, like, oh, everyone who comes in is going to have just as good of an understanding as I do. But in reality, that's not the case. Like, we had people who were signing up for Airbrake. We had one guy who was like a trucker who signed up for Airbrake. Because like an Airbrake is something that truckers, like 18 wheelers <laughs> use to slow down the highway. We were like, dude, no. <laughs> You're not even close. And so this is the problem that you guys just, everyone needs to be aware of, is that a lot of times your customers have very, very little idea of what you do relative to your knowledge. And so, what does that mean when you're designing onboard? So that means a couple. So one, really hitting on your value prop. And we're going to go through uh, an example of a really strong user onboard get response to the really good. Have you, have you guys seen a user onboard by Samuel Field before? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So another thing, quick announcement. Uh, we have a challenge at the end of this, right? So I talked with Samuel and Whoever wins that challenge, like, gets a free copy of this book for 50 bucks. So 
you guys won't get two books. <laughs> so, yeah, so anyway, so we'll go through onboarding, but what this means, if you think about, people don't really know what to do that well. So what that means is like, keep it very simple. Focus on communicating the one or two things that your product like does really, really well. And then don't overwhelm the user with like the thousands of potential amazing things they can do with your application. I'm sure they do. So we had this problem where we had people signing up and originally someone would sign up, they would see a list of like the 12 programming languages we supported and just them. Because they were like, this isn't for me, I don't want to look at this list, I'm not sure like how to download this repo from GitHub and then install it and then come back to the app. It was just like all over the place. And so what we did is we changed the onboarding so that someone would create an account, they would select what language they were going to use, and then we would automatically have them download the gem, give them like a line of code that takes in the terminal, and there we go. This is like a drop down you mean instead of a giant list. Yeah, exactly. So, so it used to be like list, and then you'd click, you'd go to GitHub, download the repo, have to install the repo in your terminal, then add your every API key, and then come back to that. Like, error. So we no analytics on GitHub. What you say? No analytics on GitHub either, right? Like yeah, I mean, so we were like, well, I hope they activate. You know, like it was it was really bad. And so we, we the only insight we had was number of people that installed the gem versus number of people that signed up in a day. <laughs> that was not even you know someone could sign up five days ago and then install the gem. Like that was it. So it's, it was really bad. So we worked on this, and then the next thing that we did that was really important is we looked at, like I said, our best customers. And we mapped out the ideal <coughs> flow that every person that signed up for Airbrake would go through. So in our case, that was, they would sign up for Airbrake, they would tell us what programming language they use, they would install and deploy our three lines of code in their app, they would capture their first error, and then they would mark that error resolved in their dashboard and invite a team. And so like, if we could, that was the ideal state that every single sign up would do when they created an error account. So do you guys have, so this is what I mean when I say like, try and think concretely about what you want every user to go through, ideally, like your ideal user use case. Or look at what some of your best customers have done and just say, okay, they went through all of this, like this is what we want all of our users to do. Does this make sense so far? Cool. So, can I ask a question? Yeah, um, absolutely. On the enterprise level, uh, for example, I'll have we use like Marketo to okay. do our tracking, um, and we will have people that won't make an account. For example, we still have to get them. So when we have uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, come up and we want to pick up the phone and call them, uh, or they do come in and they want to, they might create an account, but they actually Aren't able to test product or go in that. There's something that's a player score for the state. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's too good to be pre sign up for an account. How do you kind of what are some of your ideas? And two is post sign up. If they're just kind of generically making an account, but you still want to go and put them in, is it yeah. just figuring out how to put them in as short time as possible for that type of corporate buyer? Or yeah, yeah. So uh, if you so I'm getting that to that in like okay, so one I'm sec. No, 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 dude, not at all. Uh, I'm just trying to like lay out if you wanted to start with activation, like here's how, here's the progression that I went through, yeah. like fix offs. And so, uh, shortly I'll get to like the tactical things that we did to actually be able to move the needle. So, yeah, but like, let me know if I don't answer the question. So, yeah, so after mapping out this ideal flow, you should have a good sense of where, and doing, you know, tracking and stuff, you should have a good sense of where in the process People are falling off. Like everyone can see this. Uh, you can see that the create list, the customize step, is the one that the fewest number of people in being a part creator ended up completing. So if you have this map, you can see like, okay, 80% of people go step one or two, 80 go step two to three, but only like 40 go step three to four. And so that would be a really, really good place to start running tests and start figuring out what is happening between steps two and three. So now, how do you figure out like what's going on in to cause that gap? 
So a lot of people at this point are going to say, like, if you test testing, like, optimizely, you know. I actually think that's kind of stupid. So with activation, like, a lot of this stuff is gets in the user psychology and why people do or don't do with an action. And so A-B testing is amazing if you're just testing like large groups of traffic and you're testing copy and all of this stuff. It's not as good when you have to solve a very, very specific problem because almost by definition you're just like throwing shit and like hoping that the data can tell you what works. So what we did in our case is our activation was so low, like we could have A-B tested and gotten up to like 35, and 40, and 45. Or what we did is we did like a qualitative research project where we were like, why we call, we set up follow room, and we did a lot of different things to just talk to users and say like, why did you not go two to three? You know, like what, what happened on step two that you weren't motivated enough to go on step three? And so there's a couple different ways you can get this qualitative info. So one, set up a survey tool like follow room. Um, do you guys know what that is? So it's like a little, um, it's like a little pop-up that comes up in the bottom right hand corner and you can just ask them a question. So you could be like, so for us, we asked them, you know, hey, saw you were doing, you like sign up for Python, why did you not finish install? And then they just type like a quick response and we collected all that data. The other thing you can do, how do you spell it? Qualaroo, it's, it's the worst name. Qualaroo, yeah, I've got a better one. What is it? It's Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Do you want to plug it quickly? I do. Thank you. But actually, Sitting well. Yeah. yeah, my company is called Vendit. Okay. It replaces Marketo. It replaces Get Satisfaction and Mobile Social Email Marketing, Surveys, CRM, Project Management, everything in one. It's enterprise level tools for SMBs at startup prices. Got it. And you guys do quality stuff. You have like yeah. qualitative surveys. Yeah. Cool. We've got a we've got two different kinds of forms, and one of them is called tickets, and you can adapt that to uh, replace like get satisfaction using those forms. Got it. Okay. And I like it close to you. I like Olark. Yeah, it's Olark also like great. it's just ties into my Gmail, and it's like yeah. customers G chatting me. I'm yeah. just like, oh, this is awesome, because oftentimes people are willing to submit like that mm -hmm. one-liner, totally. but like they're willing to keep talking. I'm like, oh, tell me more. And they're like, totally. this is perfect. And we integrated OLARC, so those responses all go into your CRM invented. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally with you. So like live chat and follower are two great tools that you can integrate at key points where you want to learn more about why people are not completing the action. So the other thing, you can set up a tool like Crazy Egg, um, just to see and with uh, user testing, I think. Usertesting.com, you can like, set up a session to see how people navigate your app. Uh, or crazy, I just to see like, where people are clicking, what they do, and the like. The last thing you can do is call people. So I know it's not like growth hacking friendly, but seriously, getting on the phone with people is amazing. So what we did is we had a couple larger accounts where they weren't, they didn't finish activating, and then there was like a massive chance that they were going to cancel. So what we did is like I literally sent them an email. I was like, hey, can I send you a thirty dollars Amazon gift card if you hop on the phone with me for like thirty minutes? And for the this for the size of deals we were looking at, like that was just such a no brainer. And then we got to figure out why these large accounts didn't complete the steps that we wanted them to. And it turns out that a lot of them, like an individual developer, signed up for the product. Uh, to an individual guy at Oracle, and he needed his team's buy-in in order to like promote it throughout. The so that is something we had no idea. Like we never would have guessed that. You know. So what we ended up doing is we built a little uh, toolkit thing that said like, hey, if you need your team to install this, like click here, and we emailed out a link to all to the libraries for people that they give us a email address. And like that was a huge win for us. So seriously, call people. Amazon gift cards are amazing. Like you have no idea what someone, like a developer who makes like 150k a year, will do for like 30 bucks. It's, it's ridiculous. Like that and a T-shirt, they will like hop on the phone with you. They'll do whatever. It's ridiculous. So once you've gone through this process, is everyone with me? So once you've gone through this process, you should have an idea of where people, where you're calling, people are calling. 
some rough reasons for why they're falling off and why they're not completing the actions you want them to take. And so now it's time to figure out like what you can do, what you can build, what you can try testing. Like now would be the time for A/B testing. So you, that, this is where you have a hypothesis. So say, like in our case, it was people are not going step two to three because they need buy-in from their team. And so what we did is we built a thing where a little toolkit, like I just explained, and it worked really well. So now is the process, is the time where you try and figure out, okay, what can we build, what can we do to get people to complete this stuff? So a couple key things to think about here. One, focus on steps earlier in the funnel if you can. So if you have, you know, let's say uh, the scheduled print to download is like 80%. And the create list to customize eighty-two percent. Always try to focus more on the steps that aren't working earlier in the funnel, because fixing that will just have really compounding effects. That then you can focus like down the line. So down the line, are like smaller tweaks, still really powerful, but earlier in the funnel, you'll see like way larger. Uh, and so the other thing is there's this amazing case study by uh, the Groove HQ guys where they talk about. Something they did where they looked at leading indicators of cancellation and activation issues. So, for example, they found that people that spent less than 30 seconds on their site and logged in less than three times in the first two weeks, like, were very, very likely to end up canceling. So, what that meant is they set up a automated sequence where whenever someone had one of those key indicators that they were likely to turn, likely to not activate, they would get a personal email. And like a follow up phone call, just saying, like, hey, saw you haven't signed in, what can we do? So, leading indicators, like for, for us, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it was people not capturing errors in production, which is a big one, and then not generating test errors on the first couple of days after they created the test. So, now we have all of these. So, now you should have an idea of stages in your call, ideas of Things you can test, and the specific stages that you want to work on through. So I'm going to talk about the seven things that we tested and I ran through that meaningfully improved our activation. So the first one, if you guys don't have lifecycle emails, like very very easy, but very very big win. Like highly recommend doing it. Everyone knows what these are. Like yeah, so like our product drip, nurture campaign, and all that. So like someone signs up on day one, they get an email on day three, day seven, day you know, fourteen, all of that. So these are huge for a couple of reasons. One, like we talked about, a lot of customers don't really know what your product does when they sign up. And so educating them slowly throughout the period of their trial just like hugely helpful. So you want to show them, you know, in our example, uh, we saw that people were just getting super confused when they saw all languages we supported. But a lot of our larger customers also had apps in multiple languages, so it was something that they wanted, just not at first. Because it confused them and then they were balancing it like kind of confusion. So what we did is we did a educational campaign for like two weeks after they created an account, we would send them email and just say, Hey, saw you integrated with Ruby or Python or whatever they had. Like here are a bunch of other notifiers and tools we have for other languages. You know, click the download or like respond to this email and we'll get you set up. Like that was also a huge win because some, once someone integrates, uh, once someone like integrates multiple languages and multiple notifiers of ours into their app, it like they're way 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 less likely to return. Question. Cool. So the other thing in terms of. Um, in terms of lifecycle emails, customer education emails are great. An automated welcome email from the CEO works like pretty well. So we just someone would sign up, our product manager or CEO would send an would send an automated email where it would just be like, hey, so you signed up for the product, what do you think? How can I help? And we got like a twenty percent response rate to that, where people would say like Hey, I'm looking for this, or I'm testing it out for a company, or I'm struggling to figure out how to get this stuff. And all of those would go right to our support, and they were just absolute gold for making, figuring out higher value accounts, or um, for kind of like figuring out where people were getting stuck, giving them personal support, all of that. The uh, the uh, um, are you 
is it like really from the CEO in that, are you trying to like fool the, do you like wait two hours and then are, you, are yeah. they actually thinking, oh, what a great thing, they reached out, or are they like, yeah, this is automated, but someone will probably respond to it. You yeah, know so I mean? we first did the personalized, and then other, a lot of people started doing it, and so that became like obvious, and so then we just did like a CEO auto-responder, essentially. Mm. And people so, still respond to that at the same rate? Yeah, because yeah, I mean, people, like if you reach out to them and give them an opportunity to raise their hand and say, you know, I don't understand your product, or like, this is what I'm struggling with, a lot of people will take that opportunity. I think, I think most people know that when they get an email follow-up shortly after visiting a site from the CEO or, or whatever, they know that it's an automated email, but they also have a perception that because it does say that it's coming from the CEO's office, that any response to that email is going to have more juice and get more, and get more attention even if it goes to support it. You're responding to an email sent from the CEO's office. It's just it's just kind of a psychological. Yeah, and I will say, so my mom has no idea what an autoresponder is. But like I think people here for sure know that it's an autoresponder. Like my parents would have no clue. They would get fooled by this like every night. So I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you're not like we were selling to developers, they're pretty savvy. So they they knew what was happening. So we just changed it because we weren't fooling anyone. Uh, but if you're selling to, you know, other groups of people that aren't online all the time for the job, like I think it works. Really Even if you aren't fooling them, though, they're happy that's in your company culture to follow up. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, totally, totally. You mentioned that um, you were going to sell this computer to the house. Uh, that's an experiment in general. Mm -hmm. um, so, what's your impact on that? Oh, you know, we really science is so much getting out of the service. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Nobody likes to get emailed frequently, and yet email marketing works. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you could expect to be found with um, yeah. what things you could get, are there things that you're doing the same, and are there things that could very be very like It's a good question. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard the stereotypes of like developers like hate sales and marketing, you know, like just can't stand it. So what we actually found is that when you deliver value, like if we, so sales emails were like the worst emails you could send, and those just, like we got so much hate the one time we sent out a sales email. Um, so that didn't work. But that said, sending out a customized email that included information around helping our customers build better products, like they got open rate and response rates just as strong as like industry averages that don't target developers. So I really just think that, I think it's one of those things where you see, um, I, I don't know, where just people who do this wrong, like do email marketing wrong, like blame the audience, you know what I mean? So I, I think it's like that dude in college who like never talks to women and then says like, they don't like me, or like, they're all like too dumb for me or something like that. You know, it's like, no, you're just not approaching it the right way. You know? And so that's what we saw um, on our side. Like, just people in general respond well to this content. So, uh, so the other the other thing that we did that worked really well here is throughout the uh, autoresponder campaign, if we saw someone had not taken an action or replied to an email that we wanted to do, and if they hadn't opened the email, we created like a segment of people that had not responded, had not opened the email, um, and had then signed up for more than two weeks. And after two weeks, we just call. Because like they weren't responding to our autoresponder campaign, they weren't responding to our reaching out emails, and we still wanted them as customers. Like, and so that that worked actually really, really, really well. Um, what tools are you using for your email campaigns? Yes, yeah, so we used Mailchimp, uh, Mailchimp, and then we used Powpack for like our sales emails. And then maps are you yeah. paying right off the bat? No, so it's free thirty day trial. So for tracking whether they've opened and responded to email, is that Tau app that you're doing that? Yes, Tau app and sales email. So that's like a one to one, or you can use one of them and drop them in the link. We were just doing people that didn't sign up or didn't open uh, one of our campaigns, like our autoresponder email. We would just run the report and say like, show me everyone that didn't open this, and then just like 
learn how to ask, and then we have a call. Yeah, used in like call. Sorry. And then with Mailchimp, you were able to tell what languages your customers or the potential customers hadn't used before, and then load that into a custom ID. Yeah, so we did this. That was with Mandrill. And so Mandrill allows you like. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Or not. Uh, sorry, no. Mandrill is the delivery part of Mailchimp. Yeah, yeah. So like uh, Mandrill and Mail are both like transactional emails. Yeah. Okay. How did people actually respond when you called them from somebody who hadn't done anything? Like, was their response good? Yeah, super happy. I mean, so we we never got, and well, we have one guy, but uh, we, <laughs> we never had anyone like get really angry at us just because a lot of times they were like, oh yeah, I forgot to do this. Um, you know, can you guys help me or can I extend my trial or my company no longer want to do this? And either way, we can just like figure out something, like a way to work it out. So that, that works really, really well because I think that so many companies are so resistant to picking up the phone that they're like, well, for our list, responder campaign didn't work, they're like, I'm never going to talk to those guys again. You know, and this, and so what that means is you automatically have a competitive advantage if you're calling people, like, no, almost no other service is going to afford to call you back, you know. And especially if you're a business customer, we call you and we say like, "Hey, we care about you. You sign up for this. We want to make sure you're getting the value that you expected when you created an account." People just respond with very positive, you know. And so that's the thing that you're Yes, we did. Yeah. So that was one of our uh, acquisition hacks, and we found that it decreased signups by like eight percent, which was way worth it for us, and activation from calling people has increased it by way more than that. So it, it worked out. Um, and so the other thing in terms of email is we had our inside sales people around week two or three, as they were ending, nearing the end of their trial, we would just tell them, like, hey, if you upgrade your account now, we'll show you a t-shirt. And like, again, <laughs> that worked really well. Like developers who make a lot of money wanted our free you know, t-shirts. So that was really cool. We also tested uh, giving trial extensions to people who completed certain actions. So we tested shortening our trial to 14 days and then extending it to 30 if they would invite a team member, if they would install a mobile intentional notifier. And that also worked well, although it was a, we learned a lot to code so we didn't end up implementing it, but like the test worked well. And then I left the company, so I don't know if that works for the record. But like the signs were there, that would work. So the other thing I want to talk about, well, sorry, number two of the seven things that we tested and worked well, uh, is onboarding walkthroughs. So there's this tool um, called App Cubes that is really helpful and allows you to design kind of an onboarding walkthrough uh, without having to do a ton of custom code. Really, really cool tool. Highly recommend it. Um, you can just do like very simple notifications and guides for someone that signs up to your product and wants to go through those steps. So that, again, that's a, what I was talking about earlier with the drop down, select your language, and we had a custom page based on the language you selected, and we had a little cool tip thing that showed you what you could do on the editor dashboard. Is it like like a little iframe and you put like little pop-up messages over yeah. your product? Yeah, okay. exactly. exactly. So the other thing uh, that we found is visual clutter was a huge thing. So uh, basically, if, you, if someone signs up for your product, oftentimes you want them to do so many different things. Like, you know, you want them to upgrade the account, you want them to invite their team members, you want them to install like your other languages and like sign up your email list, sign up your blog, follow you on Twitter, just do all of these different things. And so what that leads to is like real clutter that is just not good. And so we spent a lot of time trying to simplify the process. And uh, I want to go over one. This is like the worst. I challenge someone to find a worse website than this. Uh, <laughs> have you guys seen this? Okay. this car? Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> so, terrible. So, like, compare that to the notebooks. This mouse is not working super well. But, no. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is like way simpler outline. You know, very clear, like, now, dude, you can call up, they chat and love. 
it's just much leaner, you know. And so this is focused on. I should have pointed out what was what the call to action is on the list power form, but I can't get that call. So this is like very clear, like three calls to action, things that you need help preparing, you know, all of that in the bottom right. But this is very much oriented toward the few people that hit the web page, and it only gives them like a couple things to do. So again, for us, twelve languages is stupid. Like try and get people to focus on one, maybe two things per step, and they have a much higher likelihood of completing that step. Did you ever try driving to language specific landing pages <laughs> from like like specific language placements like JavaScript Weekly, and then you drive just to the JavaScript. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that was more around uh, acquisition. So we tested that uh, in terms of like user acquisition, mm -hmm. but we didn't see it had, it didn't really have a huge impact on that uh, activation rate. But those people activated it roughly the same way. Really? Okay. Yeah. I know, I was kind of surprised too. But <coughs> yeah. yeah. It was a worthwhile like, user acquisition thing. So the other thing that, uh, this is number four, the fourth thing that we tested was calling people within five minutes of them signing up. So we, we tested this for two weeks, and this is one of the best things that we did. Because we asked for a phone number, they sign up, they are likely in your app or reading an email that you sent, and suddenly they phone ring. And you, it's, it's like you on the other side saying, why did you sign up? How can I help? You know, like what what makes this an awesome Why did you sign up? <laughs> Dude, but it's actually super helpful when you're like, what problem are you trying to solve by creating an account for us? You know? And people were very, very receptive to answering, telling us the size of the company. And this allowed us to do a lot of um, a lot of like lead scoring stuff as well, around like, okay, this is so we had one guy. We had one guy who uh, signed up with his Gmail and called him. And he's like a PM at Apple. And so we're like, oh, hey, <laughs> happy to talk to you, man. And so we ended up closing that account. And that was all because we called him. We spent a lot of time getting him on the phone, walking through the onboarding, doing all this stuff that we wouldn't have necessarily done otherwise. So calling people, can't recommend it enough, uh, especially if you're in the early to mid stages of figuring out why people are not active. It's amazing for qualitative, it's amazing for BD. Highly recommend that. Tools for doing that? Like, I mean. Oh. Yeah. So. Is close, it like, okay. Close IO. Close IO. Oh, that's they, they have an integrated, uh, you can call people through their CRM, which is really cool. So that's what we did. Uh, that was really, really good. So your phone would just ring? Oh, so we had people like calling them. Got it. But I'm saying when a conversion takes place, like, how do you get alerted that that happened? Oh yeah, so we set it up in the CRM. So okay, got our it. sales guys would see that, so they make a call. Um, and you know, so this was we were getting uh, less than a hundred times a day, so this was actually mm -hmm. feasible to do. And we didn't do it for everyone. Once we figured out why some people weren't happy there, like at a certain point, we had a um, rough lead scoring where it was like Twitter followers, LinkedIn profile. We just called the people that looked really important during the first step. Yeah. That was awesome. Other thing, number five, fifth thing that we did is support. I highly recommend tagging people for support in whatever support tool you use. Tagging people who have just signed up within the last 30 days. Because the faster you get back to them and the better customer experience they have, the more likely they are to convert. And so we had a thing where our enterprise customers bolted to the top, followed by people who had signed up in the last 30 days, followed by everyone else. And that was really, really helpful. Like, if even if I don't love your product, and you get back to me in 30 minutes after I sent you an email about like what's not working in my app, that's an amazing customer experience. That is amazing for activation, but also for like word of mouth referral, general overall experience with uh, whatever tool you guys have. So uh, the sixth thing. Um, so this is something I touched on earlier. Is tag high value potential accounts. So. If they're a large company, or even a mid-sized company, depending on what your pricing structure is like, do whatever you can to get them to activate. Like they've already signed up for your product, that is the hardest part. So do whatever you can, like, to get them to activate. We um, so we like 
we sent t-shirts, we sent gifts, we took a little lunch. Uh, we had Airbnb actually. So they signed up. They were like three weeks into their trial and we went over to their office with like macaroons. We were like, so guys, like we just want to drop these off, say hi. And we talked to them and they were like, oh yeah, you guys don't support, like you don't you guys don't have a Node.js notify. They were like, oh no, we actually do. And they're like, oh no way, we were just gonna cancel this and like sign up for <laughs> And then they ended up paying us like multiple thousands of dollars a month. And so that like paid for macaroons for like <laughs> for two years, you know. So that is awesome. We did a similar thing with uh, with Square basically. So we walked in, we went to their office, and you know, we scheduled a meeting with their office and said, you know, we're coming out with these new product features. We wanted you guys to know since you're one of our, you know, since you're like pretty new to the product, here's some changes we're gonna be making, we'd love your feedback. And we took them from a ten figure, or like not ten figure, that'd be ridiculous. Uh, ten thousand dollars a month, like twenty five grand a month, like just after that meeting, because we were able to take in a couple of things that they cared about into our product and be like custom edit them. So like talking to these high value accounts that are like is just insanely worthwhile. Like that meeting was worth more to us in terms of revenue than if we had doubled our time for that office. Like these high these enterprise accounts can do a lot for you. Um, if we're sort of like flagging which accounts are high value, is that just like by the domain? Is it, you know, yeah, so domain, uh, LinkedIn profile of someone that signed up. Like a lot of times you'll find enterprise people. Especially like VPs and directors will sign up for like a Gmail account or something if um, if they're just they just want to kick the tires, you know. And so yeah, so we just we did that with LinkedIn domain. Those are two really big ones. Yeah, and so that that's also um, that's why having a CRM with like that kind of setup is really useful because these high value accounts can like totally change the game. Uh, and then the last thing that we did uh, was. We activated and tried to save those people that were about to cancel. So before we had like a one-click, like cancel or you're done. We implemented something where for certain pricing plans, if you were paying us more than hundred dollars a month, you had to call us to cancel your account. And like some people really didn't like that, but when they called us, we would just say like, hey, we had one person, which is true. We had one person who accidentally canceled their account. Like they brought on a low-level developer accidentally canceled, and then they lost all of their exception data. And so we were like, hey, you know, we just want to make sure that you don't lose this important data, that, which is sort of true, but more we just wanted to talk to them and see like, why they're canceling. Um, you know, and so they would be like, oh, okay, so we're canceling because of this. And we ended up being able to save 40% of the people that called us, just by saying, because a lot of times it was just like miscommunication, they had been customers for a year and a half, and didn't know some of the new features we released, like a lot of very basic things, you know? And so that was a really big thing. For anyone under $100 a month, we had a form where you hit cancel, top down, we asked you like, why are you canceling? You'd hit submit, and then instead of canceling, you'd get another pop-up that just said, hey, while we address this issue, like, do you want to extend your trial another month till we do? And like, we had a bunch of people take us up on that, it was like 25%, which was, again, like those people were canceling, like they hit the cancel button and we were able to save them. And so those were, those are the seven things that we did like tactically uh, to activate and retain people. Um, any questions? Yes. A lot of the stuff you're saying is sort of against conventional wisdom, which is to concentrate on people who don't want to, the people you're losing, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say you should concentrate on the ones that are kind of happy and get more out of them and sort of concentrate on the yeah. success, more successful plan. Yeah, so that is a totally different, it's a different approach. I mean, with us, you know, we had, we, we were activating at such low rates that it would have made no sense. Even if we could have gotten double the revenue from our 30% that were activating, like, it was, just, it was just way more valuable to focus on those that would have been happy with the product. Like, it's not like they were unhappy with our product. We were just doing a terrible job of onboarding them, showing the value of the product, and getting them engaged. So I think that's totally right. Like, why market to people that hate you? But I think that a lot of activation is actually not tricking people into using your product, but it's just better communicating the value prop 
and what you do to people that would love you otherwise, but that just have had a hard time with getting through your funnel, understanding what you do, and all that. But a lot of this goes back to, you know, the average person spends like less than five minutes signing up for your site. You know, like it's awesome because people love me after five minutes, but you can't always cut that out. You know, does that make sense? Any other question? In your case, the vast majority of people like hate you in the beginning. Didn't hate us. Straight up the majority. Didn't hate us. I have a question. Is this group that's working on this separate from the group that's pushing people into the top of the funnel? So we, so this is a good question. So it was uh, kind of both. Okay. So basically, so I was like running sales and marketing for a small team person team. Uh, and so I set up, so I like kept our paid campaign going, and like put a pause on new activation campaigns while we figured this out. Yeah. Cause like, uh, like I said in the beginning, everything you do around user acquisition is like cut by, it's, it's however percent, whatever percent you're failing active, it's that percent of the effort that you're doing. You know, so if you can acquire customers with $10, and only half of them activate, you're actually paying $20 for active users. And a lot of people don't own this number. So they're like actually unprofitably requiring the customer to be their customers. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Oh, did I answer your first question? Yeah, you did. Cool. Um, I mean, it was probably more in depth, but this actually came up there. It is, there's this like shitload of customers I have that I don't want. I know that sounds bad, but they, we can't, the they can't afford it. So we, we were starting off, like our load time would be like 10K a year. Mm -hmm. um, and we use Marketo, and so this is like a big thing that's like keeping those people out, but at the same time having the large corporate buyers that are going quickly with some emails or have really good demanding things start getting easier harder to cross that point of so mm -hmm. where I can actually get a small amount of stuff on board so we can keep up the small amount. Um, you know, it sounds like what you're doing, kind of everybody that came in, I guess, you try to get activated. Uh, is that true, or were you at the same time filtering all the people that you could? Yeah, so we tried to get everyone activated, and then we did things on the back end, where, so we started out free, like, we had a free plan, and then we scaled up um, price point. And so what we did is we had a, a policy that people, if you were a free customer and you emailed in, we would just say, like, hey, you know, hey, customers get priority support, we like don't really have a guarantee that we'll get back to you. So you can see because we're offering a new thing this week that goes for like two and a half years and we're you know, basically supporting it. So we just can't support like, all of our free users. And that we not only drove upgrades, but it also filtered out the people that didn't want to You know, perfect. So that so we, we did that filtering on the back end. But like, you know, from our standpoint, uh, one of the reasons we got acquired is because we have so many customers. A lot of you know, big chunk, a substantial chunk of which are free. Uh, but on top of that, like if a free customer can get through our flow, love the product, use it frequently, and then tell their friends, like that's free marketing to me. I'll totally take that. Yeah. You know, it's just I don't want to spend my resources supporting a customer that that's not free. Is that number separated from churn? Like when you're looking at like what you churn at the end of the month? Yeah, so we did MRR churn. Okay. Which monthly recurring revenue churn? So we looked at like revenue churn versus user churn. 